Well, Rich, we said we'd be back and we're back. We're back, baby. Talking about Star Trek The Next Generation, a 30-year-old outdated television program. So let's get into it. Rich and Mike's second top five, top 10. Well, it's a sequel to our top five, which was really kind of a top 10. So Second right now what we're doing is top, top 10, 10, 10 top but on the bottom 10, half of but that's really Star Trek The 20. Next Generation episodes. Rich, during the commercial break, we flipped a coin. The quarterbacks from each team selected heads or tails. <laughs> I won the toss, uh, but I defer it to you. Oh my God. So I could start off on the second half. That sounds, that sounds fine. Uh, I have uh, Booby Trap as my number 10. Booby Trap. It's no coincidence the word boob is in Booby Trap because it's an episode about Jordy LaForge being perverted. <laughs> it's, it's an episode about a horny Jordy LaForge who in the middle of a, a crisis finds love with a woman who doesn't exist. Maybe we can do it again sometime. Uh, I, 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 I like Jordy. I heard you once say that Jordy was boring and I, I, I completely disagree with you. This is the be and end all of Jordy LaForge episodes. Yes. It is the only Jordy LaForge episode. Uh, with the exception of the terrible episode where his mother is a ghost and <laughs> he flies in a fire pit to find his mother's ghost, uh, which is terrible. Jordy is an underrated everyman. It's what everyone says about TNG is like, I want to live there. I want to be in that universe. I want to be friends with these people. And I think Jordy is probably the only person who might actually bother to be my friend because LeVar Burton is just so naturally friendly, which is why he hosted Reading Rainbow for 30 years. Well, it looks like a great party. You don't mind if we join you? <laughs> also, the other thing I like about Jordy, from a writing perspective, they never used his blindness as like a crutch outside of, outside of the first season. I think that's one or two episodes, but it's never like, Jordy episodes aren't, I'm blind and I really wish I could see. Jordy, we have the surgery, but you can only see for one day with your real, they never fucking did that. And I, 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 I love that they just kind of sidestepped his disability. It's like, yeah, he's, he's got the visor, but he's just like everyone else. This episode starts out with him on a date on the holodeck, and he's just, he's just striking out with this, with this woman, and uh, he's trying too hard. He's, 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 tr he's trying the, the standard, you know, wine and dine, here's the romantic evening, and he's, he's not just being himself, which is his problem, which is why when the, the, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Well, no, I think that's, that's a, what the, the track you're going down is perfect. Yeah, Because okay. uh, I'll, I'll, I'll help you out here a little because I was like booby trap. Okay, that's, that's that episode, you know, where they're, they're stuck in the, the booby trap that sucks the energy. When they try to move, it shoots radiation at them. They're trapped. That's the episode where Jordy makes the holographic lady, right? And they kind of sit there and, you know, and then I rewatched it and I discovered a wonderful little subtext layer. You know, I've always thought that technology could solve almost any problem. But sometimes you just have to turn it all off. And the whole episode is, is, is basically about re relying too much on technology or just letting go and being yourself, taking a step back. And that's, that's Jordy's problem in the beginning. And it's, it's painted out so clearly. And that's what's so great about a lot of these episodes where I'm noticing, which I'm gonna talk about Timescape later, okay. that's, on, that's on my list, where there is a wonderful opening segment that, that basically sets up the theme of what this episode is about and that carries through to the end. Jordy is on the holodeck. There's a lady he likes there. You know, he says, you want another Coco Nono? <laughs> uh, he's trying to get her drunk. Uh, he's oh, she says, it's a little cold. He's like, I could turn down the breeze, you know, and they have a beautiful ocean setting. And then he, then he makes the guy with the violin come out. I, pro I programmed the holodeck perfect. And she's just like, no, you know. And then mid episode, he talks to Guinan and he's like, Guinan, what am I doing wrong, you know? I'm, and she's like, you're doing just fine with me. You're just being yourself. She always knows what's what. And, and, and that ends up being the arc of the entire episode when we get to the booby trap part. Yes, because, because the, the, the Enterprise discovers a, an absolutely ancient distress signal. 
coming coming from this this little asteroid uh, belt, and and they go there and they find this ship that's like one thousand years old. A Bermudian battle cruiser. The other the other half of this episode, the, the Picard bit is uh, you know Picard is very much into uh, archaeology, and Picard is geeking the fuck out about this one thousand year old ship. Usually Picard's pretty reserved and. He's very visibly giddy in this episode. He gets to go on his ship in a bottle. It's something they reference, there's like a scene where Picard is all, it's like building a ship in a bottle, you ever do that? And nobody, nobody fucking else did. It's like, what the fuck? What the fuck is this crazy old man talking about? Ships and bottles? It is exactly as they left it, number one. In the bottle. The ship in the bottle, oh, good Lord. Didn't anybody here build ships in bottles when they were boys? Except, except for O'Brien, who, who decides to suck up I did, sir. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. In that particular moment, I build ships and bottles, sir. I love how he, he asks it to Worf and Data, and Worf is like, I didn't play with toys. And <laughs> Data's just like, I was never a boy. And, and he does, he connects on a certain level with his counterpart aboard the ship. And that counterpart was in charge of the lives of all the people on his ship, which is the arc for Picard at the end. So, so we, 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 you know, Picard geeks out, they explore the ancient ship, and they, they all go back to the Enterprise. It's okay, it's time to go home. Oh, no! We fall into the same snare that killed them. A thousand year old booby trap. Because the Enterprise can't leave, because apparently what happened to the ancient ship is it got caught in a booby trap. And when they try to leave, there are these like devices hidden in the asteroids that just suck off all of the Enterprise's power as it's trying to leave. It's like a it's like a finger trap. Yeah. You know, the more the more power they use to get out, the more the trap keeps them in, in place. Picard needs Jordy to figure out how to get them out of this trap. We need we need we need to outthink this trap. And so then Jordy gets sucked down this rabbit hole where he, he finds the notes of uh, Leia Brahm, who helped design the Enterprise. And he, just bit by bit, he kind of ends up on the holodeck with a holographic representation of, of Leia Brahm's. So in, in the holodeck, without, the, without trying to, to woo a lady, just, just being himself as an engineer, falls in love with the hologram of Dr. Leia Brahm's because he's, he's not trying. He's not trying to woo her. He's not trying to get out, here's the roses, here's the wine. It's like, well, you know, I'm an engineering problem. Let's figure out this engineering problem. And that's, that's Jory's thing, he's being himself. He's an engineer. And he gets to be an engineer with this other engineer. Don't go away. I mean, a computer save program. Yeah, and, and to be fair, uh, she is a little, overly warm uh, and receptive, which we discover several episodes later, which in real life she is not. But that's a whole other story. That's, that's the sequel episode, the which sequel, is also good. Which is also good. The Forge. So you're the one who's fouled up my engine designs. But yeah, like when you, when you watch this episode, uh, which, which for, in my memory was, was sort of just like, an, eh, okay episode. But when you watch it and you say it's an episode about how the Enterprise gets caught in a booby trap that irradiates the ship when they try to leave and everyone will die, what happened before, that is the surface level. The real story is Geordi learning to cut loose the ties of technology and to be himself uh, and to be more, more uh, confident in, in his natural persona, not to over overthink or overtry with everything. Yeah. And, and that is the problem when trying to come up with a solution to escape the booby trap, uh, he learns his lesson and they, they, they parallel each other. His, his love life and the escape from the booby trap end up being similar because the solution to escaping the booby trap is to not overly rely on technology. He's like, to... we gotta do this, we gotta rewire this and blah, 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 blah. We get 6% more power if we rewire this to that section. Yeah. And, then, and then he's like, wait a minute, the solution is don't do anything. Turn it all off. Turn it all off. But not if we shut everything off. 
One blast of everything we've got left for a microsecond to beat the inertia, and then we shut it all down, except for minimal life support and two thrusters. No impulse engines, no computer. And so that's where, you know, Picard's art comes in. Is Picard the best pilot on the ship? No. But it's Arguably the Riker is, but that's not the point. The point is Picard says, this is my job, I'm the captain. The, my counterpart, I have respect for him, but he didn't get his crew out of the situation. It's up to me. Well, because Picard's also talking about, like, you know, his ship in a bottle, his, back in the old days, they didn't have the instruments to rely on. They just had themselves and their navigational equipment. And they yeah. They did it on their own. Right. And then so Picard steers the ship like that he at wants the end. To be, he wants to be the old, he says something about, uh, imagine having one propeller to keep up yes. an aeroplane. Manning the earliest spacecraft. Flying an aeroplane with only one propeller to keep you in the sky. Can you imagine that? Now the machines are flying us. And so essentially that's what they do. Um, I thought it could have been a little, a little more exciting at the very end when they shut all the power off. I was, I was just picturing in my head where it's like, you have this action music, dun, 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 and all the all the all the all the terminals go off. You show all the parts of the ship. Everything goes dark. You know, people have flashlights, and it's a little more exciting. But that's fine. They spent a little too much time in the middle, where Jordy's like, you know, chit chatting with the holographic Leia Brahms, and I was like, okay, okay. Um, and then they get out of the. It's not. I don't think it's an asteroid field. I think it's the remnants of like a planetoid. Was that what it was? Okay. Neither side expected Aurelius IX to be the decisive conflict. There's not much left, is there? The destruction is remarkable considering the primitive weapons of the period. They referenced the fact that the battle was so like crazy and violent, like blew up a whole planet, <laughs> and it's just like floating debris from a, a, a battle that yeah. occurred, I think. Yeah, so the solution is cut everything but minimal life support and just use like one thruster one little burst from the impulse engine just to push the ship and then just a little bit of thruster almost like like you're coasting your car you, you know you turn off the engine you, you you keep the heat on maybe and that's it and your car just kind of coasts down a hill we're out of gas yeah, we're just out put of it gas. in neutral we'll take the gravity down the hill so the layman equivalent to that and picard picard i think does a little trick well, where he 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 does Picard has the, the human intuition. He does the thing the computer never would have thought to do when we don't, we don't have enough juice to make it. Picard uses the gravity of the giant asteroid to kind of swing the ship the rest of the way out. Data's impressed. Yeah. You have used the asteroid's gravitational pull as a slingshot. Excellent. Yeah, Data's impressed. A, a sophisticated computer in the 24th century would, would never have thought of that. But that's okay. Picard did. It's a theme you'd probably never see nowadays. It's a very like 1980s attitude towards technology. Yeah. We're so fucking reliant on computers now, like shutting it off would, would never be the solution. I, don't know, I, I like that episode. It's number 10 in my top 20. <laughs> number 10 in your top 20. Yeah. There's one, one, one little bit, one little bit I liked. Brent Spiner is good at acting like he's faking emotion. It's just, just, a, just a tiny little thing. Once, once Jordy strikes out on his uh, holodeck date in the beginning, Wesley sees Jordy walk into 10 forward and goes, uh-oh. Uh-oh. And then Data is confused at first. Well, once Data realized the date failed, completely emulates the uh-oh that Wesley just did. Uh-oh. Commander Data to the bridge immediately. Yeah, and it's so obvious that he's faking it, it's perfect. There's another moment like that in an episode that I'm gonna talk about called The Game, mm -hmm. when Wesley comes back and they surprise him in the, the room and Wesley tells a joke, everybody laughs and Data kinda goes, <laughs> For a second there, I thought I was on the wrong ship. <laughs> <laughs> so Wesley, and it's like, he never really did that too often, but, um, it is, it is pretty obvious and funny when he does it. It's always clear when he was faking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I th uh, a good episode. I love the little uh, uh, Geordie. It's a good Geordie episode. And I think this is one of the earlier ones where I remember thinking they really upped the game on the special effects. Because a lot of those shots where the Enterprise is like moving through the asteroid belt or the 
debris field or whatever yeah. look really good. And um, I think this is like right at that time when it started to look really good. And it used to it used to be kind of a dull episode, but I appreciate what it is now. How do you feel about the very ending when Picard's command is, let's make sure that no one gets caught by this booby trap ever again. And Riker goes, Mr. Wharf, for 45 photon torpedoes, fire. Make sure that booby trap doesn't bother anyone again. Mr. Wharf, ready photon torpedoes, set to detonate on impact with a Promelian vessel. And then they just blow up this ancient ship. You're at the point where you have to wrap up the episode even though that would have, that should have broken Picard's heart. Yeah, and he, he probably could have said, why don't we put out a little warning beacon? Because they've done warning beacons let's, before. Let's get a team of, of highly specialized Starfleet engineers to think about this, and then a fleet can come in later and try and disable it from a distance, and maybe we can rescue this, this very valuable piece of ancient history that I love so much. Yeah. Yeah. But there was no clarification on his command. It's like Riker, Riker's got a little bit of intuition in him. I, I get that, you know, but. Mike, the episode's got to be 46 minutes. <laughs> we, got, we're at, we got 12 we're seconds at, left. We're at 45, uh, 52. We got to end. I just wanted Picard to go, no, no, no. I meant, I meant a warning buoy. <laughs> and then Riker, Riker's in, in the brig. <laughs> That's how it ends. No, that, that's a nitpick. It's just a fun little gag. Picard gets kicked out of his archaeology club. Yeah. yeah. You destroyed a, a Promethean battle cruiser? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like blowing up the fucking Egyptian pyramids. <laughs> Somebody got bit by a snake. <laughs> Let's make sure no one gets bit by this snake again. Fire a nuclear missile. <laughs> Destroy the priceless artifact. Blow it to smithereens! <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Like, like Indy firing a bazooka at the Ark, he couldn't do it. Yeah, right, right. Okay. Even though it would have stopped the Nazis, he didn't want to blow up the Ark of the Covenant. You're right, Rich. Yeah, it would have been a nice ending, uh, but it, it, it had an explosion at the end. It made made people happy. Yeah. But great pick, Rich. Booby trap. Thank you! Don't go away. Okay, Mike, so what is your next pick? My next pick, which I'll just go right into it. The order doesn't really matter. There's no particular order, um, but I referenced it in our Booby Trap review. It's the game. The only good Wesley Crusher episode. Now, let me go on the record with a very unpopular opinion. I don't dislike Wesley Crusher. Really? He's better in later seasons. I think a lot of the Wesley Crusher hate comes from season one. I've never really got, I never got that vibe of, of I hate Wesley Crusher. Watch this. <laughs> it, <sighs> I'm, I'm. I'm with Starfleet, we don't lie. I'm not like fully on the bandwagon where I have pitchforks and I want to see the character beat yeah. up, but. He's kind of obnoxious in that first season when he's so much smarter than everyone else and half the episodes revolve around him. I, I get why he's disliked. It's Wesley I wanted to speak to you about. The boy and such musical genius as I saw in one of your ship's libraries, one called Mozart, who as a small child wrote astonishing symphonies. A genius who made music not only to be heard, but seen and felt beyond the understanding, the ability of others. Wesley is such a person. He's Roddenberry's insert character, I think. Roddenberry's what? It's self, Roddenberry's like self-insert almost. See, I always, I always thought it was more cynical than that. I thought it was like, well, you know, this show is, has a bunch of old people on it, stuffy old people, let's throw a kid in there Maybe young young people, 13, 14, 15, young boys will be like, cool, you know, like, I want to be like Wesley. I want to go on adventures in space with, you know. Forward view screen is controlled from the ops position there. Which uses high resolution multi-spectral imaging sensors. How the hell do you know that boy? Perimeter alert, Captain. Wesley. I'm sorry. Wes, you shouldn't have touched Get off the bridge. 
more of a marketing thing, like like a relatability. We need, we need something for the kids. Yeah, a relatability. That thing. could be kind of like how Riker is the William T. Riker is the James T. Kirk. You know, through, he's he's the suave, uh, handsome guy who, who sleeps with ladies and you know. <laughs> We don't want a stuffy, bald diplomat, you know. Well, what, how young kids are they going to like this? And that's kind of how I got Wesley. But um, I, I never like. I guess what would be the worst Wesley episode is when he he falls on a bunch of flowers, <laughs> and they want to execute him, right? And, no, Wes. No, it's forbidden to disturb new plants. Uh, yeah. That's the planet where any, every, literally every crime carries the death penalty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they have this perfect society, and, and they're, it's only like, like a good legal episode, you know. He didn't know, but well, we got to respect their laws. The game is like a invasion of the body snatchers yeah. kind of episode. I'm trying to decide if it's a Wesley episode. It's more the female uh, crew member who never shows up again. Oh, uh, Ashley Judd. Ashley Judd, She does yeah. show up again. Does she show, when does she show up again? She does come back again. Leffler, what's the resonance frequency? 0.34 over standard. Uh, I, I don't know if it's just one time or a couple times, but she just has a couple lines here and there. Jordy's like, Leffler, you know, what are you reading on your screen over there? And she's doing something in the background. It's in, it's in one of the episodes that I watched. I can't remember which one exactly. I, I guess it's similar to Barkley. Once you have them on for that season's guest star episode, you film a couple other little bits that you can throw in here and there during the season just to remind people that that character exists. Uh, Ashley Judd was the famous daughter of a, a country singer. She wants to act, everybody. You put her in the show and, you know, oh, uh, she can get two or three episodes, you know, that sort of thing. So um, she does come back, but um, w Wesley comes back. From, from Starfleet Academy. He's taking a break from being at the Academy, and uh, he has a little adventure aboard the Enterprise. Thank goodness he comes back, or else the flagship would have fallen into the hands of the Buttheads, an alien race with butts on their foreheads. But really, the, the whole thing is Riker's fault. <laughs> Riker, Riker is a sex pervert, and he goes to Risa to sleep with a buttheaded <laughs> uh, it, it, He gets no uh, retribution or, or punishment for what he did. Almost, you know, he should be in jail. He was told it was a game. Yeah, okay, okay. I guess, I guess. He, he should at least be demoted in rank you, to you, Ensign. You wear the, the game on your head and scoring points in the game is like getting hit with a straight shot of heroin. Yeah, it's, it, it messes with the endorphins. Yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure. We get to see Riker's O face. <laughs> Which is un uh, unfortunate. <laughs> we we, we see, get to see a lot of people's O face. Yeah, we see Doctor Crusher's O face. Uh, we see Wesley faking an O face. Uh, in an incredibly uncomfortable scene with a girl he's he's interested in. Let's lay in the bed in my quarters and pretend we're fucking our own brains. <laughs> um, but anyway, the, the premise of the episode. My, my, my favorite bit though yeah. with, the, with this with this game is that who's Wesley? I think is in the turbo lift with uh, Nurse. Uh, Ogawa. Ogawa. And she's like, she's wearing it. She's clearly just tripping out. The secret is just not to play the game. It plays itself. That's great. There's some peer pressure. There's some drug use uh, themes, but it is it is a, a brainwashing device. It is a uh, invasion of the body snatchers kind of premise where everybody uh, is bad and uh, so the, but it starts off with Riker on Ryza, and Riker hooks up with a floozy. <laughs> right off the bat, they're they're playing around, right? They're goofing around and they're running around. And this is these are the little touches that I'm talking about when I watch the show, right? They're not just like she's not just like ooh, come and get me, um, come get me, and he chases her around. What does she do? I know they're just playing around in the bedroom. Right? I don't remember what specifically. She has taken his comm badge and she's teasing him with it. And he's like, I need that. That's important. Oh. And then she throws it out the window. Right there, Riker. You know, she's up to no good. And it's a nice little, it's a nice little way to set the stage. She's up to no good and she usurps his authority. She takes away the one thing that's that's ties him to the Enterprise. 
There's something wrong. Also, also something he could use to call for help if it goes bad and he, he's on to her. So it's, it's it, while subtle and it looks like just general horseplay, it, it's, uh, it's a nice little, little like, because you, you look at the episode from a writer's perspective and you're like, what do you, what do you have them do? They have them just smooching, right? They just, they're just smooching. And, and she goes, hey, why don't you try this game? No. She steals his comm badge. That's some very, subtle, clever shit. It's, it's very telling of, of her character and her future motivations, because I think she's the one at the very end. Yeah. Her hair's in a bun and yeah. she's all in a military uniform, and Riker should have blasted her. I knew I shouldn't have ever trusted you. But yeah, so it's like little things like that. So you think it's a Riker episode, and, and this is what I'm talking about, where you have that opening scene, and at the end, Riker and Troy should have been sitting in 10 forward, and he's like, you know, Troy, I should vet these b I sleep with. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I've learned my lesson. I've learned my lesson. I shouldn't go to Risa and sleep with any butt-headed female alien who just walks up to the bar next to me, right? I've learned my lesson, but instead it's a Wesley episode, which is fine. Wesley comes home, he gets the cold shoulder. The senior staff is in a meeting. You're supposed to go to your mother's quarters. Oh. The fake cold shoulder, which is great because he's like, uh, every, uh, Chief O'Brien's like, everybody's in the in the, the conference room. He's like, do you mind if I stop in? He calls Worf. I suppose that would be okay. Worf's all mad. <laughs> um. Wesley Crusher has arrived. Monsonov, he can stop by the observation lounge to say hi. I suppose that is acceptable. Uh, that's his setup. Is he's 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 feeling like alone. He's feeling he he's not with the Enterprise anymore. He's an outsider, technically. And there's a new brainiac, uh, uh, wunderkind who has taken his place. Robin Leffler. She's the young, young uh, girl who was on the upstart. And right, because keep it up, Leffler. Keep it up, Leffler. You're gonna go places. Remember, she's majority singing her praises. She's the new, and her and um. Uh, Wesley kind of spat a little. Why aren't these registering? You might try calibrating them manually. Excuse me? The detectors, they tend to get temperamental. You can try calibrating them by hand. You know, she's like, mm, I heard you did this, and I, I, do, I do this here. And he's like, well, 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 we change this around. And Wesley's out of his element. He's an outsider, and that plays into the theme of the plot, which is uh, everybody starts fucking turning on him, <laughs> and, and <laughs> something's really, something really bad is going on. Tarvokian pound cake. Tarvokian pound cake. Another thing I'd like to talk about, which we, we really didn't bring up in our first uh, episode or two of this, whatever it is we're doing, talking about our favorite TNG T episodes. TNG Love Fest. TNG Love Fest. Um, it's kind of looking at these episodes more from a structure perspective. Like we're talking about openings, setting the stage, Who's the sh what character is the show gonna focus on? What's the overall theme? Because you have a little plot, right? But you always have an overall theme. And then also, um, acts. Because I kind of like, I, I was like documenting, why do I like this episode, right? What, what makes it work? And a lot of times it's, you have your, your introduction. The, these shows are done in five acts, right? You have your first act or your intro um, before the, t the credits start. Yeah and that tells you what the story is. And then you have four more acts, basically commercial breaks. At the end of each act, there's something changes and you know, in either intensifies the drama or you learn something new and the story changes directions, things get worse and worse. Um, and, and, and a lot of times I'd be like, why did they end this act that way? Um, which I'll talk about Timescape. But I think the, the structure of this one Solid. Introduction, Riker on Ryza. Hooked up with a lady who shows him a game. Discs and cones. And I like the fact that when they remastered the Blu-rays, they didn't update any of the special effects. They recreated them to look as terrible as they did back in the day. <laughs> but intro is Riker on Ryza with the lady, uh, and she shows him the game. He discovers uh, that it, it's a very pleasurable game. Cut to credits. First act, Riker comes back from Ryza. He, he initially tries to get Jordy interested in the game, right? And he's like, Jordy, you know, hey, I brought this thing back from Ryza. It's pretty, pretty cool, you know? And I think that's, that's also a way for the story to let you know that it does work on Jordy. 
because that, that was another <laughs> question too. It clearly wouldn't work on data, but would it work on Jordy? And Riker goes right to Jordy. We get that out of the way right out of the bat. Jordy, you wanna try this game? I'm busy, I got a, we're doing a survey of the Phoenix cluster, a bunch of stars or something. Uh, I, gotta, I gotta work on all this stuff, okay, fine. He leaves, you know, some other things happen. Wesley comes back, he chit-chats with Picard about uh, his days at the Academy, yada, yada. Who does he go to next? It's uh, Crusher, wasn't it? Was it, who was next? Counselor Troy. Oh, uh, yeah. And a wonderful little, little touch in the writing. What's Troy doing? Oh God, I've watched this recently and I don't remember. Is she sitting in her office with a patient? She just got done with a patient, uh, uh, counseling a patient. Nope, what's she doing? I don't remember. She's sitting in 10 forward all by herself, gorging on chocolate ice cream. Her addiction. She is a secret glutton for chocolate ice cream. And she's talking about the, the ritual of how she, she does her ice cream. Boom, perfect target, right? That's a wonderful thing to have the character doing. Wonderful, wonderful action that lets, lets Riker know she's a good target. To, to be interested in something pleasurable because she's, she's eating ice cream, right? Didn't think about this shit when I was 11 years old, right? <laughs> what a genius little thing to, you, you don't, she's not just walking down the hallway and Riker says, hi, Troy, I, I brought this thing back from Risa. Would you like to try it? Well, sure. No, it's, it's subtlety. She's, 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 she's indulging herself in ice cream. And, but that's the end of act one is Troy's like, ooh. Tell me more about this game. Music swell, commercial break. What is it? Just a game. The game spreads around the ship. What do they have to do? Dr. Crusher to Data. Data here. Do you have a minute to join me in sick bay? I need your help with something. Yes, Doctor. On my way. Data is going to be immune. They gotta take so out So you data. need to take care of the data problem. And that is when the stakes are raised yet again. Because he's not just he's not just spreading it at that point. Now they are actively doing harm. Now their subconscious crew is there there there's a plan. It's not just a game that everybody enjoys playing that's that's you know like drugs or something. It's that, more sinister it's than more that. It's more sinister than that. And that's when we discover that it's more sinister. Uh, is is Crusher presses data's off button and then Riker and Troy come in. They're like, seal the doors. You know, let's get to work on, on cutting his servos so that he doesn't wake up. And then we're like, oh my God, something really <laughs> bad's going on. <laughs> Meanwhile, Wesley and Robin Leffler are kind of flirting and, and they're both kind of nerds, so they're not interested in the game. I think they go on a date. Crusher's really pushing Wesley hard. She's like, try it, come on, try it. Try, I'm going on a date. I'm trying to get ready. Bring her back here, we'll all play the game together. And he's like, no, no. So they go there and then turn forward and everybody's like, like hooked on this game. And, and Wesley, in true nerd fashion, says, I think I'd like to learn a little bit more about the game before I try it. Because that's what, that's what people, you know, when someone offers you like cocaine or heroin or, you know, I think I'd like to read up a little bit more about this cocaine before I try it. Hey, hey, that should save the enterprise. <laughs> That's right. I wonder how it works. Why don't you try it and find out? I'd like to know a little bit more about it before I try it. A a abstaining nerds uh, uh, who, who don't give in to peer pressure save the enterprise. Thank God Wesley's a wet blanket. <laughs> <laughs> so they go back to... Um, they go to the science lab and they're looking into it and blah, blah, blah. And oh, this thing's psychotropically addictive. It's a real problem. He goes to Picard. End of the third act. Really raised the stakes is. So uh, we find out Picard is secretly infected when Crusher goes to him. He's like, I, I found this thing. It's sinister. We should look into it. And Picard's like, yes, I'll, I'll look right into it. And then in second, Wesley leaves. Picard yeah. just waits and waits. It's like a, a beat. And he's, Puts on the thing. Yeah. He's doing something in the foreground. He's like out of focus and, and come, you know, and then turns around. And, and he clearly put the game in a, in, <laughs> right in Wesley's uh, sight line, but eh, it's, it's a four by three television show. No one noticed that. It's on their <laughs> tiny little TV screens. But uh, yeah, and then Wesley then, you know, 
final act is uh, Wesley realizing that Robin has been uh, probably forcibly made to watch the game, play the game. And uh, then it becomes a wonderful little chase where they try to get Wesley. He's the last one, you know, as it's a secret alien plan to take over the Enterprise. The Enterprise has been secured. We await your further instructions. By Evil Aliens. And I have another episode that's virtually identical to it. It's a better episode. It's a better episode. But I, I, I enjoy this one a lot because... Is it, is it a weakness that, that Data saves the day in the, in the Wesley episode? No, because um, they uh, intentionally kept that from us. Uh, we don't see Wesley repairing Data. We don't know that Data has been repaired. So there's still that, that tension and, and excitement at the end. Yeah. It's kind of lame how Data saves the day by flashing a flashlight at everybody. But you know, hey, it worked. <laughs> but had they had a scene where, da where Wesley sneaks into sick bay and fixes Data and says, Data, there's this bad shit that's going down. I will work on a solution, Wesley. Just keep them occupied. We didn't know Wesley was keeping them occupied. We thought he was down to his last. And they push him into Picard's chair and they hold his eyes open and everything. And we think, oh gosh, all is lost. There comes Data, saves the day. As he so often did. It's a fine episode. And I'll get into my, it is my, uh, it falls into my ramping up a problem episodes. I've discovered there are two types of episodes. And I'm discrediting all the schlock, wharf, uh, soap opera crap. There are two types of episodes. <laughs> the escalating problem episode, right? Uh -huh. Where something starts off small and it gets worse. And what I call the pick up the pieces episode, where in the very beginning, something big happens. And then the rest of the time we're picking up the pieces. This is an escalating problem episode. I'm sorry, internet. I don't mind Wesley Crusher. I don't hate him. I don't love him. He never bothered me as much as he seems to have bothered other people. I really don't care. Like, like many things with Star Trek The Next Generation, he improved significantly after the first season. Right. Tractor beams are my specialty, Skipper. I'll contact you when that's done. Wesley out. Wesley? Wesley! That's a decent pick um, for, for my uh, ninth ranked episode. I am going with First Contact. For me, the reason I like this, it's, it's kind of similar to Who Watches the Watchers in that it's a, 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 a First Contact Prime Directive-ish episode that's told from the, the alien's point of view. What are you? Like the main characters in this really, really isn't like Picard. It's it's the the alien scientist and the the, the alien presidents. We're, we're basically we we have this world that is kind kind of similar to, to Earth today, and they're right on the verge. Their scientists are right on the verge of developing warp technology. They're they're about to go out of their solar system for the first time. 12.4 after launch, the warp field generator will be activated. That's when it would break the light barrier? Yes, Chancellor. If we're successful, the craft will leave our star system, and in a matter of minutes, we'll be on its way to the Garth system. And, and the Federation, who are just, just kind of keeping a track on all these aliens in, in you know, the area, they, 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 they know that this area, that the Federation knows this planet's on the verge of going out in space, and so they're preparing to make first contact with these people for the first time. We're about to beam down and, and say hello. And but before Starfleet does this, they, they, they actually have people on the planet in disguise. We're just kind of like, just scoping out the, the culture. Like, how are we going to be received? So they have little observational teams running around. Unfortunately, Commander Riker, who was in disguise on the planet, he, he, he gets injured during a riot that's going on on the planet. 
and so then he is in medical custody, and the doctors on the alien planet discover that Riker is an alien. I had cosmetic surgery to correct a genetic birth defect. And these? Another birth defect? And it's, it's kind of this diplomatic situation where, uh, you know, Picard, he's, he's got to make first contact, but he's, he's also kind of got to get Riker out of there and this alien culture. They're, they're uh, pretty paranoid in general. What if there's more of them? They could be everywhere. Gordon off the wing. I want security on his door 29 hours a day, and I want this kept quiet. Well, from I haven't I haven't rewatched this one. Mm -hmm. uh, from what I recall, there was sort of like a a clash of um, ideologies. There was there's like what would be considered like a religious conservatism that were like we're the only people in the galaxy. Like the doctrine says, and then the then the more like liberal-minded kind of like we got to go out in space there's alien planets uh, there's other life out there kind of, that sort of like conflict was happening there's right? there's uh, it's it's not specifically said like the religious and this is our religious doctrine but there's clearly the conservative faction right the people were willing to accept your social reforms because they believe in you chancellor but there are many who say we have gone far enough that likes things the way they are. They're, they're very kind of resistant to change, a little bit paranoid, and then there's clearly a more progressive faction on this planet who they're scientific progress and we need to, we need to grow and we need to change. And then in the, in the middle of all of this, this political right and left wing on that planet, there is the, the Chancellor, who is a character I really like because he's just like a a very classical concept of what a president should be, what a leader should be. He's not uh, dogmatic for one side or the other. He's constantly like weighing the options of what is best for his people. It's like, well, I, under I see the value of progress and what progress can get our people, but I also understand the needs of the conservative faction and, and I have to balance this. What's he doing this November? <laughs> That's, that's, that's the thing that watching this is very uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to imagine this, this chancellor getting into a debate with President Trump. And it's so, it's so fucking depressing. Well, I'll I got rid of the individual mandate. Excuse me. I got rid of the individual mandate, which was a big chunk of Obama. That is absolutely a big thing. That was the worst part of Obamacare. Chris, that was the worst part of Obama. Well, I'll, I'll ask Joe. Joe. Yeah, I, no, I, I, no, right. Joe Joe was the was with Bernie Sanders and the far left answer. on the manifesto. I think we shall find we have much in common, and much that is not in common, an opportunity to learn from one another. Well, you're, you're, you're not agreeing agree to it. Socialized and medicine. Look, why don't you observe what your campaign agreed to as a ground rule? Okay, so one and two. Go ahead, friend. Picard makes first contact with with the counselor, and they. They, like it's like Picard has kind of like met his diplomatic equal, and they they have these 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 conversations with each other. Where they're, they're not, not yelling at each other, not, calling each other names. Yelling, they, shut up! Shut up! Here's what I gotta say. <laughs> what is it? What what was the word you used? Con, converse, conversation. Conversation. That's where two people exchange ideas. Okay, okay. And they communicate with one another. Oh, interesting. And somebody, somebody actually like finishes a thought without being interrupted. <laughs> oh my God, what, <laughs> what kind of show is this? What, this, this truly is science fiction. It's this, it's this version of politics that's, that's very just fictionalized. Okay. okay. You know? It's like, it's, yeah, it's science fiction, basically. Yeah. They pay just a tiny fraction. I love the, can the Chancellor character. He's got this line on this where like, you know, he knows that he's not the center of the universe anymore. It's like, uh, he's got this line where it says, uh, this morning. I will have to say this morning, I was the leader of the universe as I knew it. I was leader of the universe as I knew it. Sell it, Rich. This afternoon. This afternoon. I'm only a voice in a chorus. I am only a voice in a chorus. But. But I think it was a good day. I think it was a good day. It's just, it's depressing. I love this episode, but it's depressing to watch. Okay. 
well, in this day and age. I understand. I understand. Yeah, what what ends up Riker is just sort of like the catalyst for this like. It's just debate. sort of the, the catalyst of everything breaking down. It's as opposed to this just being a pleasant episode about uh, this alien race learning that alien life exists for the first time. You got you gotta have some some drama in there. Does and he, that's, does he like fall in love with an alien or? Does well, that's he, that's. That's that's why this is like my my ninth favorite episode and not one of my top three. Yeah. There's this this needless kind of cringe moment in there where um, Riker's trying to find a way to, to quietly escape so he can get back to the Enterprise, but he's in the hospital and there's like security all around because they know he's some kind of weird alien. One of the one of the doctors. I don't know if she's a nurse or a so doctor. She's always wanted a fucking alien, right? She offers, she offers to help get him off. Uh, she offers to help get him out of the hospital, but only if Riker will have sex with her. I believe you. Now, will you help me? If you make love to me. It's actually Lilith from Cheers. What? I've always wanted to make love with an alien. Yeah, kind of, kind of similar to your. Um, Kelsey Grammer cameo because I guess I guess they filmed Cheers like right next to the fucking oh, Star Trek okay. TNG set so it's like Lilith's like can you put me in an episode and it's this, this cringe comedy moment in an episode that's otherwise just kind of a happy a nice go like a drama fiction. yeah I really have to get going all the other aliens are waiting for me oh it's not so much to ask and then I'll help you escape <sighs> It's not that easy. There are differences in the way that my people make love. I can't wait to learn. This could be like a like a, a classy 1950s sci-fi if you just make it the humans. Like, the, the Mr. President, the aliens have landed. I could I could see this working yeah. as like a day the Earth stood still. Just just uh, style. You just roll reverse. You, you roll yeah. reverse everything. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I suppose grown up me, adult me would appreciate it more. I never, I didn't get around to rewatching this one, so I don't have much input. I remember it. I remember all the, you know, the beats and stuff. But um, I, and to me, it never stuck out as one of my all-time favorites. It's a favorite for me because I, I watch this. It makes me think, what if, what if, what if the aliens landed tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Now for me, for me, it's, it's just the, the big picture fantasy of what if this happened? I've always wanted to make love with an alien. Okay, Mike, what do you got next? You, you do realize that we have a large number of fans who, who don't watch Star Trek and have no idea of what the fuck is going on right now. They just know that a goofy mask has suddenly materialized upon your head. Why, Rich, I didn't hear a single thing you said. <laughs> but what I can tell you is, Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. Well, Rich, this is the head of the El Adrel creature from the Darmok uh, episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. We purchased this. It is the actual head of the creature that, that, that appeared. It's like an interdimensional monster that lived on a planet. It's like a, it's like a dumb predator. Yeah, it's just a creature that lives on a planet that uh, uh, Picard and the captain of the alien ship have to team up to fight. Um, so this is, I think they, they slapped this mask together and probably a costume as well. Um, it, it, it's not super, there's some veins going on, um, but really it was meant to be sort of like uh, two-dimensional, glowing, really kind of hard to see. So they, they just put this together. But as yeah. far as I know, this is the only one that exists and it's the actual head from the monster. <laughs> Don't, oh my god! It's fine. It's fine. You, you fucking spent money on a unique prop and then just throw it away like garbage like that. <laughs> <laughs> just, ah, fuck it. It's fine. It's one of a kind. 
Fuck it. It's a piece of television. It's history. from one of my favorite episodes, Star Trek: The Next Generation. Uh, the episode is Darmok, and it's it's made famous by Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra, which is only famous because they say it 58 times in the episode. I really, uh, I really like this episode, despite the fact that you could nitpick the logic of the aliens' language to death. It's really just an episode about communication. You're still assuming this is some kind of challenge ritual. We can't be certain of that. We're only making educated guesses about their motivations. No more than that. The, the reason this has never made any of my top lists, it's a quality episode. Almost, almost every ex episode of TNG is quality. But the reason, the only reason this, I, I dock points just because their language is so utterly stupid. <laughs> it's similar to like a, an alien species that can only communicate in like internet memes. <laughs> well, see, I, I think there are, there are ways. It's like, it's like you got the, like the person at Tactical just, just suddenly says, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Hands in air. <laughs> and then the, the captain says, Jackie Chan makes the face. We do communicate. Crying woman screams at cat. <laughs> Picard, hand, hand in face. <laughs> Picard, and then the guy next face. to him, Picard and Riker, hands in face. Rich Evans, superimposed, sits on couch. <laughs> <laughs> so you have the universal translator, right? Which, which... Uh, it's it's, it's like, the it's the ultimate hand wave. Without the universal translator, is complete bullshit. It's this device that's never really explained at all, like where it is. It's is sort it, of explained in Deep Space Nine, where it's like a device that's implanted inside of their ears. Welcome to Earth. Do you understand a word of that? Our universal translators must be malfunctioning. Where's that reset button? Ouch, that looks like it hurts. My name is Quark, chief financial officer of the Ferengi Alliance, and I've got a business proposition for you. But it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't make sense where... Like, if, uh, everyone should be looking like an overdubbed foreign film, right? Where their mouths don't match their lips, yada, yada. You know, you, you know what I mean? Where, yeah. But it, it is a hand wave where it's like, just don't worry about it. Because without the Universal Translator, Darmok would be every episode of Star right. Trek where nobody ever knows what the fuck anybody is saying. You show up and then you'd have, to, you have 25 minutes of like, oh God, can we figure out their language? You know, they just appear on the screen and they start speaking English and their lips match their, their words for English. They don't, it, it would be too weird if they were going, you know, and English was coming out, everyone would be like, what's going on? Like your, your TV audience, fine. Uh, and, and the Darmok episode, I see more metaphorical kind of like, here's what the story is as opposed to the logic because with language, you know, you have w words like uh, uh, super technical words to describe like the intricacies of building machines, you know, and you can't communicate that in metaphor. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so language is super complicated and it works on like a casual conversation level Temba, his arms open. Give me more about Darmok on the ocean. Tanagra on the ocean. But it basically, it's, it's just an episode about meeting an alien race and, and not being able to communicate with them. And there's, all, there's many layers of, of that theme in the episode. It's about right. overcoming a communication barrier. Yes, and, and clearly the main part of that is Picard and the captain. His name is not Darmok, it's uh, Captain... Oh, shit. He has, he, his name's mentioned like once. Uh, it's Paul Winfield, the actor who, um, who plays the alien captain. He was in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, Captain Oh, Terrell. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so it, it kind of also reminds me of that Enemy Mine movie with Dennis Quaid. 
and uh, Louis Gossett, Louis Gossett Jr. Jr. They have they have a, an entirely different culture. The, uh, their idea is to beam down both captains and have them work together to stab at this creature, which is something from their mythos. Um, maybe something that happened a long time ago, Darmok and Jalad on an island called Tanagra, and they fought a monster. And, and they want to recreate that, that mythical event with the new captain so that they could, you know, form a bond. Well, what's, what's going on is though, because nobody, for like a hundred years, nobody has been able to understand this alien race. Their yeah. language is just impenetrable. And now this alien race, they want, they, they, I forget how they signal the Enterprise, but they want to try again to communicate. Federation vessels have encountered Tamarian ships seven times over the past 100 years. Each meeting went without incident. However, formal relations were not established because communication was not possible. Why? And out of desperation, uh, the, the Darm I'm just going to call them the Darmoks, they kidnap Picard and take him down to this dangerous planet. And the Enterprise, because they can't communicate, communicate because they can't communicate, 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 because they can't communicate, doesn't know what the fuck is going on. They don't know if this is a hostile act. Right. So there's, there's a lot of tension where they, the, you know, Riker doesn't know if this is an act of war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Riker, Riker does what he thinks is best. He's trying to get Captain Picard off the planet. You're holding our captain. I want him released. Your action could be interpreted as an act of war. Until his eyes closed. And so they try sending a shuttle down. And the aliens just nick the shuttle and the engine so it doesn't kill them, but it makes them come back. Their, Riker isn't communicating with them. Riker is having trouble communicating with Picard. It's this whole cycle of no one knowing what anybody else is doing, but Picard figures it out. That's how you communicate, isn't it? By, by citing example, by metaphor. And I think a lot with the language, it's, it's nice because they take a lot of time for him to figure out. He figures it out, but the people on the Enterprise also do too, rather quickly. Data and Troy are going through the data banks and they're like, what's, you know, Tanagra? And they find, you know, it's, it's 12 different things. Who's Darmok? Uh, Darmok is a beverage on <laughs> blah, 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 blah. And they're like, yeah. Then they find two things that connect and they realize, oh, they're speaking in metaphor. They seem to communicate through narrative imagery a reference to the individuals and places which appear in their mytho-historical accounts. It's as if I were to say to you, Juliet on her balcony. This is a meaning of love. They, we understand that uh, someone else might not. Yeah. But the thing is, if the, if the universal translator is down, the Darmoks also have English words thrown in there. This... Shaco in the wall spell, his eyes open. And it's like, those are English words. Uh, mixed in with your weird mis uh, mythical characters. <laughs> but if it was all gobbledygook, like if you said, Darmog, Glaba, Jalad, Waga, Chanagra, they'd be like, yeah! You know. um, Temba, his arms wide, when you gave me the knife and the fire. Temba, his arms wide. So the point is, is that this, this, this alien race that we don't understand, they do things very differently. And, and Picard takes the time to try to understand as this the diplomat as he is, you know? If it were Kirk, it'd be a whole different story. If it were Kirk, Spock would have done all the work. <laughs> <laughs> Kirk would have said, look, mister, I don't understand you. I'm going this way and I'll see you in hell. Have you. Spock would just be exasperated. Obviously, they're talking in metaphors. <laughs> the Spock. Kirk would be like, what? Clearly. I'm going to read them the Constitution. Maybe that will work. I'll teach them our values. <laughs> yeah. Timber. His arms wide. Timber is a person. His arms wide. Because he's, he's holding them apart in, in generosity, in giving, in taking. But I, I, I like the way they kind of, 
they kind of take you through their language and they make the audience realize right. how they communicate bit by bit. The, the thing I loved rewatching this, they actually brought this episode up a lot, in my opinion. The episode opens up and they're, they're saying they're gibberish. Darmok at Jalad at Tanagra. And you, the, the Enterprise crew and you, the audience watching it, are like, what the fuck? This is, this is gibberish. I don't understand it. And then you get to the very end of the episode where Picard gets onto the bridge just in time to stop a battle from breaking out. And they're saying the same, the exact same gibberish. But me, the audience, I follow along with what they're saying perfectly because the entire episode taught, taught us bit by bit what this means. And this, yeah. this metaphor means giving. And this metaphor means failure. And oh, yeah. Accepting, you know, his uh, arms closed, you know. Picard is telling them that their captain died when he said chakra when the walls fell. I understand what they're saying. Shakma when the walls fell. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, and, and you know what's kind of fun too? Like, I, I was thinking about Star Trek Discovery, that, that giant dumpster fire. <laughs> and, 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 you, you know, all your badass characters and everything exploding and torpedoes hitting the Enterprise, blowing up and if people flying. You can have a sword fight. Right, right, right. And Picard, they finally get Picard up and he just waltzes onto the bridge with this, this like, this attitude of like, I get the fuck out of my way, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> On screen, he doesn't even like say hi to anybody. <laughs> like, and, he, and then he just starts talking to him, right? And they're like, oh, oh, yeah, fists, his arms closed, Chakamo when the walls fell, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, okay, okay, bloop. And then he's, and all the bridge lights go back on and he's just like, that's the ultimate badass moment. <laughs> like he comes back from the planet and he, under, he learned the goddamn language himself and he comes back and he just talks to them on screen and, and calls the whole situation as, as the expert diplomat that he is and, and He's just like, I'm, I'm a fucking badass. And I did it with language and communication uh, by learning, you know, not by punching. That was one of the greatest Picard moments when he just tells the, the, the aliens in their own language what happened and, and saves the day. <laughs> Heroically told them what happened. Heroically told them what happened. He learned their language. And, uh, and, and yeah, so yes, you could argue about the the alien language and does it really make sense but really in in short it's just it's another first contact ish kind of episode that, that I, I enjoy i like that i like this episode a lot more rewatching it now when i'm older picard and dathan and ella drill then when i did watching yeah. it when i was younger the less exciting things were happening when you're 12, you don't really care about the subtleties and the... the... I care less that their language is silly now than I do uh, about the story they told about learning to communicate with somebody. Well said, that's exactly my point, is yes, the language is silly, it doesn't quite make sense in, in reality. You know, there's so many things in Star Trek that don't make sense. I, I, I can't imagine an emergency on their bridge where somebody has to explain that there's a warp core breach and they need to transfer power from an auxiliary system to stop it. Because efficiently. I can't know. imagine how they do that, and but... That's another thing, though. It, it translates into our own lives, where you can look at other, like, human cultures on the planet and go, how can they communicate like that? How do, how do these people, like, do that? Like, it's things that are foreign to us um, that, that are completely normal. Maybe they can really effectively communicate uh, a situation or, or an emergency by using metaphor that that because that, they just know every metaphor <laughs> in their entire culture in their brains and it's a, it's a concept that would be totally bizarre and foreign to us and impractical but to them that's their entire culture and 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 existence and they're really good at it yeah. right yeah and yeah. so and that's that's I think was the point is, is that you can look at a different culture and go, how the fuck do you people communicate with each other like that? Or how, how do you do that? And um, 
until you learn it and understand it. Um, it's classic Star Trek. Classic. Classic. Star Trek. And that creature is no longer a threat to anybody because I own its fucking head. My, my, my next episode. I, I know your number one you called a guilty pleasure. Your, your, uh, was the nth degree? Yeah. Last time around. This is my guilty pleasure coming right up. Uh, this is, uh, the next phase, which has no high minded ideals whatsoever. This is just straight up a fun episode. Fair enough. Uh, the, the Enterprise gets a distress signal from a, a Romulan vessel. And so the Enter Enterprise shows up and beams like Riker, Worf, Roe, and Geordi over to, to help out. Geordi you know, says, we need to fix this device. We need to go over back to the Enterprise and replicate it. So he and Roe beam back over to the Enterprise with this weird Romulan device. And they, 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 they vanish. They never rematerialize. And... Uh, the Enterprise thinks they are dead. They think they got lost in transport. But as we find out after the stinger, when, when Picard just walks right by an unconscious Ro Laren on the floor, Ro, Ro and Geordi are both very much alive, but they are invisible and intangible. Dr. Crusher, I'm right here. Damn it! And, and Ro thinks she's a ghost. <laughs> Story-wise, there is, there is a good choice of the two characters. We're dead, Geordi. <laughs> is that some kind of a joke? Because you've got Geordi LaForge, the engineer, science-minded. But my uniform, my visor, I, are you saying I'm some blind ghost with clothes? Straight up technical guy. And then Ro Laren, the Bajorans, Religious and the, the Bajorans, they have their culture. Yes, you don't have Geordi and Data, or Geordi and Dr. Crusher, where they're both science scientists and science minded. You got opposite ends of the spectrum, and then they're both dealing with: Are we in a are we in a, a technological snafu, or are we ghosts? <laughs> well, it's Star Trek, so we know they're in a technological <laughs> snafu. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but through through Ro, we we toy with the idea that they are ghosts. She's she is a character who is kind of at odds with her own culture. You know, she's she's from a very spiritual people, but she, Ro herself isn't always that spiritual. But but now now that she's a ghost, she's like, well, geez, maybe maybe the old stories were right. Well, I I was thinking about what makes an episode a guilty pleasure and what makes it a quality episode. And I was, I was thinking about what some of my guilty pleasures are. And I wanna say it's when the science is schlock. Because one of my uh, guilty pleasures and or favorite episodes, which I didn't even include on this list because this is super guilty pleasure, um, is called Remember Me with Dr. Crusher when Wesley Crusher is fucking around in engineering and creates some kind of warp bubble mm -hmm. that Dr. Crusher ends up inside. And that episode starts off with her, and there's like an old man doctor that she's friends with, and he's like, I'm so old, oh, I'm gonna, I, I, I'm gonna, and then he's the one who, he's the first one who disappears. And then people start disappearing. I'd like Lieutenant Worf to program onboard sensors to monitor all personnel. If we can catch the moment. I'm sorry, whom did you say? Worf. Chief of security. The big guy who never smiles. And then, I don't know what happens, how, what universe she's in. It's not a delusion. It is not a dream. There is a physical, measurable phenomenon at work here. Picard, remember at the end, everyone's gone and it's just Picard. And he's like, we never needed a crew. I, we just needed me. There are 114 people on the Enterprise. That is the exact number there should be. 
There are now over 900 missing. She's like, how do you explain all the fucking rooms on this ship? And, and who are these people? Who, who, where are they in her head? Are they ghosts? What uni is she in an alternate universe? Why are these people interacting with her and why are they like covering this up? What is the primary mission of the Starship Enterprise? To explore the galaxy. Do I have the necessary skills to complete that mission alone? Negative. Then why am I the only crew member? Aha, uh -huh. gotcha there. Makes no fucking sense at all, but it's a fun episode. It's collapsing. Hull integrity now compromised on decks three through 15. I think, I think- Because everyone keeps disappearing and she doesn't, she thinks she's crazy. And then a, 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 they keep trying to rescue her by this, this vortex that opens. They keep trying to suck her out of the bubble and she's holding onto furniture and stuff. But, but scientifically, it makes no sense. And that's the next phase as well. It's oh, a little better. You could, you could, you could nitpick the hell out of the next phase. There's, there's no reason they should even be able to breathe. Let alone, how the fuck do they stand on the floor? Right. I mean, okay, say, say. Because they can walk through walls. We established they can walk straight through walls. What is keeping them from falling to the floor? How does artificial gravity work in Star Trek? That they should have had a throwaway line where Rose says, well, how, why don't we fall through the floors if we walk through the walls? Well, the gravity plating must be, must be pushing up on our Anti-gravity field. On our molecule, semi-transparent molecules, right? Yeah. It's fine because it's all in good fun. It's an episode about uh, what would happen when you die and how do the people you work with and care about remember you. I guess, I guess there is a little bit to that because uh, Data is tasked with planning their funeral. And uh, Data's, Data's going around, like, ask, ask a few people, like, what would be an appropriate way to handle a funeral? Right. And I just wanted to say thank you for trusting in me when no one else would. The bigger part is Ro and her character because she, I, I, this takes place after um, well, one of my episodes, Conundrum, mm -hmm. where her and Riker have sex. And so there, there's always this like kind of thing with them and he's gonna do her eulogy and, and you know, she's kind of like listening in, what is he gonna say, you know, what is he gonna say at my eulogy? And she kind of like cares what, she, you realize she cares what other people think of her, even though she's this like, I don't give a shit what, about any of you people. She's, she's like your stubborn teenager. Commander Riker and I have expectations of her. Captain, I know the routine. You don't have to worry about me. We're stuck with each other. So let's just get this over with as quickly as possible and go our own separate ways, okay? Like a, like a brat, almost. Re rebellious. Rebellious teenager who says, I don't care, I don't, fuck you. I'm gonna do it my way. I'm gonna do it my, my way. way is better because it's my way. This is not a bright idea. I beg your pardon, Ensign? I didn't quite catch that. Nothing, sir. And then when she's dead, she really cares about what Picard thought of her, what Riker thought of her, people that she thought she was at odds with. Majority, there's not much going on there. Yeah. But it's more so about Ro, because I think they're... Well, Jordy's there more as the, the counterpoint to the spiritual journey that Ro is going on. It's like, uh, we're gonna, I'm, no, we're not dead. I'm going to find out what happened to us, and we're going to reverse it. Yeah. He's the anchor to reality. It's more of a row episode. And I think there's a scene on the shuttlecraft where um, is it Data and Worf are flying around the shuttlecraft. And, and they're, they're taking the shuttlecraft back and forth yeah. because they're terrified of the transporters right now until they can really do a yes. diagnostic because they think the transporter just killed two people. Right. And, and Data's asking about like the Bajoran death ritual or something and Worf's like, oh God, it's 15 hours long. And well, she says that. Well, that's where Worf is like, look, I'm a fucking Klingon. I'm the wrong person to ask about planning a funeral. I'm very happy for them. Right, right. Because they died with honor. Right, right. Yeah, and so it's a, it's a little bit about death, life, how you're perceived by other people. They have the funeral, which is like a party kind of thing. That's why, that's why I say this is more, this episode is more for fun because Data's funeral involves a ragtime band. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's, 
I, I'm not going to say it's played for comedy, but it's, it's played for fun. Yeah, because they're walking around. They have to spread around like neutrino particles or something like that. Well, they figure out that when they face through things that, that, that creates the, the, the chronotonic field or whatever. Some and, kind of ghosting particles that might lead data to the solution that they are not dead. Because there is a... There is a, a ticking clock element. There's, there's the Romulans well, are going to. Here's the thing: because the Romulans, well, one of the you know the twist is the Romulan ship, is been a, been playing around with this experimental phased cloak, which that comes up again later in season seven. But they're they're working on this new tech that will let you be cloaked, invisible and intangible. Which that's some that's some that's some dangerous shit. The Romulans are worried that the Federation is going to find out they're working on this. So they sabotage the Enterprise's engines. Is that the Philadelphia experiment? Oh uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, if the Enterprise goes into warp, the Enterprise will blow up. Yeah. And because Roe and uh, Jordy are phase cloaked, they overhear this. Mm -hmm. And the ticking clock is, oh shit, we need to find a way to warn the Enterprise before they go into warp. Yeah, yeah, not to turn on their warp engine. And and there is also, unbeknownst to them, a Romulan who is phased cloak. And you have my favorite scene in this, where there's a, a chase scene, where this Romulan is like hunting down Ro. <laughs> And they're just running through like crew members' quarters, and they're having this dramatic life or death struggle, while like, like people are just like getting ready to go to bed. This dude's dude's working out, and like Roe runs through him. Yeah. And um, they're having having this crazy fight while Data's just like having a conversation with somebody. And have you seen any fields in here? Right, right, right. Polite, slow conversation while there's this struggle going on. Friend? Excuse me, Lieutenant. Bro! I'm detecting a chromaton field in your room. It's uh it's played out at the end too when they have to they they realize that shooting like the Romulan phasers around. That that increases the the field yeah. that that data can scan. Yeah. Because they're trying to get data's attention through these fields they can create. Yeah. But you have this shot where the everybody's partying and they're just casually walking around shooting phasers. <laughs> Well, this is unusual. Yeah. Well, Ro, Ro is frustrated because she's never going to, she knows now that she's never going to hear what Riker has to say about her at her funeral. And so in just frustration, she shoots him in the head with the Romulan disruptor. I, 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 I do have one moment I, I want to point out early on in this episode. Uh, somebody says yes to Worf for probably the first time ever. Uh, Worf is always used to make like negative suggestions like mistrust war wharf is like like mistrustful like we have to shoot first then why do we wait if we attack the ship now they will not be able to maintain their scattering field we we we, we, we run into these aliens we don't know much about them and wharf is always the one who suggests we should load up the photon pot photon torpedoes and blow them out of the sky and he does that so that Captain Picard can say, no, I'm really diplomatic and look how good I am. He makes Captain Picard look better when Captain Picard always shoots down Worf's violence. Yes. Recommend we go to yellow alert, sir. Why? And in this episode, Worf makes a suggestion that, look, the Romulans need our computers. I don't think we should give them our computers. The Romulans want a computer. We cannot give them access to Federation technology. That is an unacceptable security risk. And Riker is like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, now let's let's just give them something old. What about a computer core from 30 or 40 years ago? One the Romulans are already familiar with. That would be satisfactory. <laughs> and Worf is so used to people just shutting him down that he actually he actually thanks Riker for listening to him. Hi, sir. Thank you. And that moment made me smile. It's interesting, this uh, next phase episode is very similar to another episode, which is my next episode. <gasps> it's called... 